my style is a little bit minimalistic. Let's see how that goes. Game master style. When you, as a game master, and the, Christopher's going to talk a little bit more about what the difference is between a game designer and a game master. The game master normally is the person that runs the game and is the person that makes all the decisions during the runtime. And when we talk about runtime, um, it's about when the magic circle starts and when you end the sort of flow of the game and the magic circle ends. Um, and in one end of this fader we have a very active style and in the, one, the other end we have a very passive style. And when you played the intro game, that was quite passive. There wasn't a lot of interaction with the game masters during the game. And when you play When Our Destinies Meets, you were in the other end of the scale and there was a lot of active participation and instruction from the game master. So this fader uh, focuses on the runtime. So if you want to be a very active game master during runtime, you need to use, uh, be very focused in the pre-game. If you have a workshop, if you have written information and so on, you have to be very uh, focused on delivering the right information there because it is very difficult to start introducing a lot of stuff during runtime if you have not explained that you're going to do that beforehand. So uh, a very intrusive way of being a game master is to do the bait and switch. And what is a bait and switch? It's when you tell people one thing and then during the thing you do, during the game you do something completely different. That creates a lot of confusion and that is bad game mastering. It has been done a lot of times because it's really cool to have big reveals of stuff and that it can be really cool but often if you change specific things, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit later, it's completely devastating for your, for your lab. So I'm going to talk about runtime. <coughs> if you are a very active um, game master, you have very much control during runtime. So, for example, when you played When Our Destinies Meet, it uh, pro probably was very clear to you that the game master was at all times steering the direction of the game and steering the pacing of the game and what was in focus. So you gain a lot of control as a game master when you are uh, pushing uh, your position during runtime. So you gain focus and pacing. What you lose is that you, or what you, what you limit is the immersion into the story. So if you have like a very intimate scene going on, and as Johanna told about that, you are all of the time you are being stopped in that sort of very intimate situation, you end up uh, with a lot of sort of stops, and that can s limit how deep you can go into that uh, position. Also, as a game master, you have um, you often uh, you w come to overdo your interaction within the runtime. So because you, are you have been working on this thing for months and months and you're, you're really, really, really deep into what this is about and you really want the players to experience one specific thing and then they do something a little bit different from what you believed and then you go in there and you, you do introduce a meta technique or you, you push the play, the, the game in, in a specific direction, uh, you have a tendency to do it too much. Uh, because, of course, you want the players to have the best possible experience that is cl as close to your vision as possible. The big problem is that you can never ever see what people are feeling so you don't know how well the game is for them. A great example is that I played uh, a game once and I was sitting, it was like a party situation, and I was sitting down and I had like uh, sunglasses on in the middle of the night, and I had like the best time of my life being really sad and I was crying and all sorts of stuff, and right next to me sat a good friend and she was looking at me and said, oh Bjarke, he's just completely off game, he's not doing anything at all. Oh, that's just, maybe he should do something active to, to get his game going. And I was just having the time of my life for 45 minutes sitting completely still. <laughs> you never know how players are feeling. That's a very important. So 
you have to trust that they will take responsibility for their own uh, experience and their own immersion. And if you do a good game, then they will have that. In the other end of the fader, if you are very passive, you give players a high level of freedom to do whatever they want. And that is very rewarding as a player. That you, if you, if you in the pre-game part, dress them and prepare them so well that they can do everything by themselves, that is very rewarding because they can take their story and their experience of the lab in, the, in a direction that they find meaningful. And as I said before, you don't know what is happening inside people's minds. So it can be very rewarding to give them that freedom to explore where they want to go. But of course, then you need to work hard in the pre-game to make sure that they have enough material to go on. Uh, it enhances the player's immersion. Uh, as also, as Johanna said, um, if you continuously break the game, it's very hard to have a consistent immersive experience. And I put in, in parentheses aesthetics of boredom, and that is a game mechanic or a tool that you can use as a, as a game designer. And something very beautiful happens when people start to get bored. Often, as a, this, this is something that you, in basically any other type of uh, pastime activity or at your job or whatever, you don't want people to get bored because boring is not good. That's not true in lab. It is, it is a tool that is difficult to use, but if you use it correctly, then magical and wonderful things happen if people sit down and they sort of rest in themselves and they, they're not given input all the time, but they, you give them time to sort of think about where they are and what they're doing. And, and that can give the character and the player a very beautiful and rewarding experience. So don't be afraid if people are sitting still with sunglasses on in the middle of night for 45 minutes, they can have the best time of their life. So don't be afraid of people looking passive because a lot of stuff can be going on in your mind. I think we all have been uh, in uh, places in our lives where we uh, were sitting very still, but there was a lot of stuff going on emotionally in our mind and body. In the in the sort of uh, in the negative part of the scale, what happens uh, and problems that can happen if you are very passive is that you have no possibility to influence the lab during runtime. Uh, and this also goes over into next, that you have no chance of damage control. So if you have a specific journey that the players want to take and they're moving in the complete opposite direction because you have given them all this freedom, it's very difficult to, if you have not introduced that you're going to do so, step into the thing and move it in the right direction. And also as a designer, you, you, must, you, you have to know that the direction that you have chosen beforehand might not be the best for that set of players or in that specific time. So when you are designing a game, that's a lot about control. When you're running the game, it can be a lot about coaching them in the right direction, but you must know and you have to know that you cannot control every single individual's experience. So it, a, a big part of being a runtime game master is about letting go and give people the ability to interact. And also, if stuff, really bad stuff is happening, for example, escalation of game mechanics. We talked a little bit about this. So, for example, if a game, if in the Capo game where you had to put three people had to put hands on shoulders, and early on the players decide that it, that is not working, they're going to do something else. Then, if you do not have introduced that you will step into the game, it's very difficult to correct things that you know will escalate out of control. My last slide is uh, some of the tools you have been you have heard about, and I have rated them from when you are when they are very intrusive to very discreet. And you, as a as a game master, when you are running the game, uh, how active you are is not only how often you are in there, but also how intrusive are the tools that you are using. So, for example, at the very low end, changing music or light in a room that is very discreet and you're not 
it doesn't feel that the, the game master is very active. And then as we move up the, 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 the scale, then if you introduce new information or if you have instructed players that go into the game and gives new information or changes the pace, a little bit more active game mastering. And when you come up to cutting and focus scenes, that is all stuff from that and on upwards, that you go in and you stop the game. So if you stop and you replay a scene, that is more uh, intrusive as, as a time jump, for example. Or, and, and at the very top you have if the game master stops the game and then he switches the characters around, also very intrusive. And at the very top, you have the change of theme. So if you go to a game that is very social realist, and then you change it into a horror game in the middle of it without telling the players, then all rules change, of course. Because if you're in a house and somebody's in the basement, if you're in, a, in like a very realistic game, you don't go down into the basement. If it's a horror setting, you as a character, of course, are going to say, let's split up, I'll go to the basement alone. <laughs> that is two very completely different games. So. Uh, be very aware which tools you, you're going to use as a game master where and how intrusive they are and how active you're going to be uh, in this thing. Everything has consequences and a good thing uh, I remember early in my design career is like, oh this tool is very cool, I'm going to use it. But I didn't really think about the consequences of using that tool and that led to some very disastrous games that didn't work at all. Uh, so always think one or two steps ahead to say, okay, if I'm going to be a very active uh, game master and I'm going to be very active with these tools, what's going to happen? And what's going to happen when I use it the fifth time or the tenth time? If it's a two-day game, maybe ten times is not that much, but if it's a two-hour game, completely different story. Thank you. <laughs>